Father. We thank you that we can be here today, that we can glorify your name. God, we lift up high your name this morning, and we, we want to sing of your praises. God, we lift up this morning's service into your hands, and we ask that your will would be done in this place. Thank you, Jesus.
stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Thank you. 
the king of my heart Me the mountain where I run The fountain I drink from Oh, he is my song Let the king of my heart Be the shadow where I hide The ransom for my life Oh, he is my song Cause you are
God, your grace is enough for us. There is, there is no more that we need because of your grace. Lord God, we thank you, Jesus, for who you are and what you've done. Father, we just thank you for this, this morning, God, this opportunity to worship you, Lord Jesus, uh, with one another, Lord God. We thank you for this, Lord Jesus. Father, we just lift up the remainder of this service to you, Lord God, and ask, Father, that your name would be glorified. That, Father, that we would raise a hallelujah, a praise be to you, O God of heaven. For you have revealed yourself to us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Uh, with that, we're going to get into this morning's topic. So funny, I've been, I've been uh, standing up here for the last number of weeks being like, we're going to go through our characteristics of God sermon series. And, uh, and, I, and I was like praying a few weeks ago, and I just really felt like there was a few things that needed to, to, to be discussed first. And, and uh, it was literally last night as I went through my sermon, and, and I didn't necessarily write my sermon last night, okay? It was, it was there. But as I was going through, I, was, I realized, whoa, I'm actually, I'm starting the Characteristics of God series this morning. Um, and that wasn't my intention when I began writing this sermon, but when I got to the end, I, I saw, God, this is a characteristic of you that, that, that we're going to be studying today. And so over the next number of weeks, maybe even months, depending on how many characteristics of God we go through, we're going to be studying God's character and our relation to him in those things. And it's going to be, I think it's going to be a really great time going through and identifying how God reveals himself. And today we're going to be starting off with the God of hope. And I don't know about you, but I think that there is some need for hope uh, in, our, in our world right now, in our communities, in our families, in our schools, in our workplaces. There is a need for hope. And the Hebrew name um, the Hebrew name for God, the God of hope, is El Tivka, which is, which is translated the God of hope. And uh, Tivka is, is the word that means hope. We translate it to hope in English. And as we go through this sermon today, there will actually be two other Hebrew words that we extract from Scripture and break down into what they mean as to what it looks like for us to place our hope and have our hope in God. And so, uh, so that's going to be where we're going today, is recognizing the God of hope. We're going to be talking about synthetic versus eternal hope. And uh, I'm going to use an analogy. And uh, in using this analogy, I realize I might offend some vegans or vegetarians. And so I just want to say outright that is not my intent. And I'm using this analogy simply as an analogy, not as an attempt to, uh, you know, converse about dietary decisions and restrictions and such. And so this is my analogy. I do not understand this, but we have vegetables that are made to taste like meat. Right? You go to A&W, and you can buy a Beyond Meat burger. Beyond Meat. It, it has no meat in it, but it is fully made to look like and taste like meat. But it's made of vegetables. I have nothing against this. I like vegetables, and if my vegetables are going to taste like a burger, I'm going to be even happier, okay? <laughs> but what a strange thing that we need vegetables to taste like meat, to eat vegetables, when we have meat that tastes like meat. I'm excited. This is a business idea, and if you heard it here and then you're a scientist and you develop it, let me know. I at least want to be part of the prototype testing. I want meat that tastes like vegetables. I want a meat carrot. You're like, it, it's orange, it looks like a carrot, I eat it, and it's just like, it's straight beef. And you're like, man, that is the weirdest tasting orange carrot I've ever had in my life. But what a, what a strange concept that we have vegetables made to look like meat. That is synthetic meat. And, and like I said, this is where the analogy kind of falls apart because I'm not necessarily against vegetables that taste like meat. But it props itself up to be something that it is not. You know what I mean? It's like, ooh, I'm actually beyond meat. I'm like meat, only I'm better. And you're like, are you? 
because you're a vegetable, and I feel like you're a great vegetable. Like, I love chickpeas, but you don't need to be meat. You can be a chickpea because you're delicious and high in protein, and you put on some little olive oil and balsamic vinegar, and you add in some tuna, and you're like, mmm. The tuna is the meat, not the chickpea. Today we're going to talk a little bit about synthetic hope versus authentic eternal hope. Because there is a difference, and one is only propping itself up to be something it is not. Okay? And so we need to, we need to realize that, that, uh, that there is a, that there is, that there is a, a synthetic aspect to life. I'm going to trip over that thing or just unplug it and then we'll never hear the guitar again. So I want to break down a few words here. The word hope is rather inter, like rather loosely used in our society. It's a lot like the word love. We love hot dogs. We love our dogs. We love our wives. We love our kids. Uh, we love Netflix. Um, very, very different flavors of love for each of those things. The word hope is actually used really flippantly as well in our culture and society. Right? I hope for some. I, I can. I can hope that uh, that my my grandma scratches a lottery ticket and wins six million dollars and ha- gives it to me because she's like, I like you. I'm like, cool. I can hope for that. You know, I hope for it. Maybe a bit of heart issue there. You know, we can hope. We can hope that tomorrow looks better. We can hope that that tomorrow will be different than today. We can hope for things that. I would like to say we're actually wishing for, not hoping for. And so I, we're going to go through the, the use of the word hope in relation and context to scripture and the life we lead. But first off, I want to contrast fear, wishing, and hope. And how fear is the opposite of hope. Consider this for a moment. Do you hope for things that happened yesterday? No, they already happened. You know what happened. Do you fear for things that happened yesterday? No, they already happened. It might... But what we do know with hope and fear is that they are futuristic events. We have hope and fear set in the future. Not, in the pre- not, not necessarily in the present and definitely not in the past. Now the past and the present have an impact on how we either hope or fear for the future. Right? Let's say you got in a fight with your spouse last night. I have fear that, that in the morning I'm going to need to deal with that fight. And I know I'm probably wrong. But hope can also be said in things in the past, but projected to the future. If we're going to go really deep, really fast, we have the cross of Christ. That is a past event that gives us future hope. So I want us to understand this morning that hope and fear are opposite reactions to future events that haven't happened yet. Boy, do we ever like to spend lots of time thinking about events that haven't happened yet. How many hours of sleep do you think you've lost hoping and fearing for events that have yet to, to come to pass? How many times have those hopes or have those, have those fears, let's, let's focus on fear for a second. How many times have those fears actually transpired? Oh man, I might lose my job tomorrow. You don't sleep all night, you get to work, your boss is like, hey, Thanks so much for meeting with me. I just wanted to tell you, you're doing a great job and I'm giving you a promotion. You're like, cool, so glad I waited, wasted eight hours of sleep on fear. Right? Hope and fear are future events. They're opposite events. How do I know they're opposite? Check this out in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. Yes, we just did an entire study on 1 John and we're going there again today because apparently we weren't done with it. Perfect love casts out fear is what we read in 1 John Chapter 4, verse 18. The driving force behind whether or not we fear or not is whether or not we have experienced the love of God. That is an interesting connection. When we lack the love, it causes a fear of tomorrow or uncertainty in a world that, quite frankly, is noisy and shaking. This lack of love places, this is what it does to you, it places the responsibility of the future upon your shoulders. What a weight to carry. Man, I as a husband have a desire to provide for my family. And if I looked at at today's landscape, 
I might have significant fear in whether or not I will be able to provide for my family tomorrow. But when I understand a characteristic of God, that he is my provider, and it is through him that my provision is made whole, that he is enough, that his grace is enough, all of a sudden that takes that responsibility off of my shoulders. Why? Because his perfect love casts out that fear. And all of a sudden, I don't have a fear of tomorrow, whether or not I'll have a job. I have a hope that tomorrow God will provide. He is enough. Do you see how that's an opposite? And that when we, when, we, when we are anchored to either his love or to carrying and bearing the responsibility on our old sh- own shoulders, it can actually cause devastating stress within our lives. Friends, I'm getting more and more gray hairs. My wife is a hairstylist. She told me the other day, I'm 25% gray. She's like, you could use just for men. She doesn't use just for men. She's a professional hairstylist. I don't know what she uses. That wasn't an advertisement for just for men. Stress is a real thing in our society. It's a real thing in your life. And we have this opportunity to to go like, God, these are the things I'm stressed about. Are any of them worth being stressful over? Because there are things that I desire deeply to see within my Christian faith. I desire to see people come to know Jesus Christ. And I'm not going to lie, some of the, the the, the quickening of my heart and the racing of my mind almost feels the same as stress. But it's founded on his love for others. Fear and, op- and hope are opposites. If you're experiencing fear for the future, friend, I want you to know that you can turn to Jesus and allow his love and his characteristics to place hope in you. There is a, there is a, uh, and then, and from there, I also want to recognize that there's a a difference between hoping and wishing. There's a Hebrew word, it's used in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 27 through 31. I'm going to read it out here. He says, why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disintegrated by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and a young man might stumble and fall. But those who hope, say this with me, church, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. What a promise. Remember, do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of heaven and earth. Not you. (laughs) Not you. His strength is unfathomable. His understanding so far incomprehensible to us. He gives strength to the weary. If you trust within your own strength, you will be let down. Trust me, I know that every time I go to the gym. When I trust in my own capacity, I am let down every time. But it says, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and they will not be faint. The word hope used here is the Hebrew word quava, Q-U-V-A-H. And it's it, the, the root meaning, or the, the, the word comes from the root meaning for the word cord. This is a tightly bound rope or something that you are tethered to. There is tension on it. You are, you are tethered to something. Perhaps like how a trailer is tethered to a car. Get that picture? It is attached to. If the car goes left, where does the trailer go? If the car goes right, where does the trailer go? It's tethered. It's hope is tethered. We are, but those who are tethered in the Lord will renew their strength. We have that song, if he goes to the left, then we go to the left. If he goes to, there's a reason I don't lead worship. 
this hope that we possess is tethered to something. Whenever I go water skiing, I'm tethered to the boat. And my father-in-law, he calls out, you good? I said, yeah, I'll just follow you. Isn't that how we're supposed to be with Jesus? Tethered, our hope, tethered to him so that we might renew our strength. Because we're not, we're, if I tried to water ski by myself without a boat, I'll leave it there. Yeah, just a parasail. When, when he goes, we have no choice but to go with him if we're tethered to Jesus. And so this is the difference, friends, between being tethered and wishful thinking. If my wife says, hey, Matt, do the dishes before I get home, and I don't do the dishes before I get home, I might say, man, I hope she doesn't get angry at me or upset with me. No, the reality is is I'm wishing. That wish has no foundation in anything. There is no reason for her to not be like, I literally told you to do the dishes. Like, I'm glad you kept the kids alive. Good job. But the dishes are not done, and that's what I asked. And so we need to understand that, there, that we need to use this word hope in context and recognize when we are simply wishing for something which is unfounded versus hoping tethered to something real. My, the hope of your salvation is tethered to the cross of Christ. It is not wishfully thinking that at the end of life we've done enough good to be there. That's a wish. That's not a hope. A hope is tethered. A hope is secure. A hope is certain. We're going we're gonna to now look into some of the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians. And we're going to talk about how there is no other Savior. 2 Corinthians 11, we're looking at verses 3 and 4. I, but I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, in your minds where your minds may somehow have been led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if some, um, if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one that you accepted, you put up with it easily. Paul's bringing a chastisement to the Corinthian church. He's saying, look, you were devoted to Jesus. But just like Eve was deceived and tricked and Adam alongside her was deceived and tricked, he goes, I have concern that you might be in the same place as them. And then he goes on, he says, if someone comes to you and preaches a different Jesus than the one we preached, or grants you a different spirit from the one, the Holy Spirit that you received upon confession of faith, or a different gospel than what you accepted. He says, you put up with it easily. Why would you not resist that? I think is his rhetorical question that he doesn't ask. Friend, every single person is in need of hope. And who knows that we have a mortal enemy by the name of Satan, Immortal enemy? By the name of Satan, who comes to steal, kill, and deceive, and destroy. And just as he tricked Eve, there is potential for us. In fact, Paul says that the Corinthians' faith was sincere, pure, and devoted. And yet he is worried about them because he believes they've gone off off track. Friend, We are to be concerned. We are to be aware when another savior is being preached. I want to, and I and I use the word another savior because you might not necessarily have someone come to you and be like, "Hey, this is Jesus," and you're like, "Well, no, that would be really obvious." But I think that there are spaces where we might be deceived into trying to find salvation in something other than Jesus. And it might look like this. It might be anything that establishes itself as the salvation of the world or a people group or a community. That has the potential to be false hope or synthetic hope. If we look at something like the civil rights movement, really amazing things accomplished through the civil rights movement. 
but it had the potential for people to put their false hope in it. And because of that, see it as the Savior. Jesus is the Savior. And so we need to be aware, not, not uninvolved, aware, and part of what happens in life. I think of politics. Man, how many times are we like, if this government gets in, it'd be the greatest thing ever. Be the, it'd be like the savior of the world if this government got in. It's a funny notion to place on the shoulders of a government. Jesus bears that weight of salvation. Can the government do good things? Yep. Can it do bad things? Yep. Can a social movement do good things? Yep. Can it do bad things? Yep. When we place our hope on things that are man-made, it has the potential to be the synthetic hope and not eternal. Now, and that's why I use the word potential, because I do want to be cautious, and I don't want to say that we can't be a part of or involved with things that are happening in our society around us. We just need to recognize that they might be an extension of what God is doing, but if we put all of our hope in that, that we've removed Christ from the place of hope in our life, and we have put him there, put whatever it is there instead. Perhaps it's, you know, hope in my next promotion will mean that my bills are going to be paid. Perhaps it's hope that when I, when I finish this project, I will feel accomplished. Maybe it's hope that when I, when I do this thing, my dad will finally approve of me. We've got to be careful with where we anchor our hope to, friends. Is it good to accomplish things? Yes. Is it good to have the approval of, of parental figures in your life? Absolutely, but when they hold the key to hope in your life, you're allowing them to define who you are. Church, I'm pretty sure Jesus does it just a fine job of defining who you are. Verse 14 says that, No wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of the light. We gotta be on guard, friends. I think we have this funny. Uh, we we know this thing in the church. Um, oh, what is it? That uh, oh uh, oh yeah. Our, our fight is not against flesh and blood. Have you guys ever heard that before? But then we continuously try to fight spiritual battles in the physical. <laughs> we know these words. We don't live them. Church, I want to encourage you today. There is no other savior. There is no other hope. There is no other gospel, there is no other spirit than that of Jesus Christ. And we need to be spending time with him to say, Lord, how do we be a part of this without making it or seeing it as our true hope because you are? How do we pursue you where you're going? How do we be tethered to you in this time, at this, at this point? There are a lot of things that are going to be calling for your attention, for you to place your hope in. There's going to be a lot of vegetables that tell you they're meat. we got to have spiritual eyes to recognize them. Because God has called us to great things like justice and mercy, caring for the orphans, caring for the widows. He's called us to incredible things, like being a representation of him on earth of being an ambassador of him. In fact, we have, been we have been called to have hope to share. In Matthew 10, verse 8, Jesus sends out his disciples. He's hung out with them for a bit. He's like, let's team up in pairs of two. We're going on a little missions trip. They go, where are we going to go? He's like, you're going to go into towns all around here. What are we going to do? Well, you're going to cast out demons. Well, that sounds crazy. You're going to raise the dead. Okay, cool. List is starting off great. You're going to free people from, from spiritual bondage. You're going to show them grace and love. And they say, why? He says, freely I have given it to you. Freely give it to others. Friends, if Christ has freely given you his hope, be generous. Like ridiculously generous. We have a, an entire 
like, th I mean, not that there's never been a time in history, but we have people that are searching for hope for tomorrow. Everything they were stable on has started shaking. Like standing on a balancing ball. And they're like, what I thought was stable is not. Where's my hope and stability coming from? Believer, you possess literally within you the hope of the world. Stabilize. You've been called to share this hope. Freely you have been given it. Freely you should share it. Be generous. How do we share this hope? What is this hope? There is a second Hebrew word that I want to bring to your attention today. And it's actually also used in the book of Isaiah. And it's yakal. Y-A-K-H-A-L. And I'm not Hebrew, so I'm probably pronouncing all of these words wrong. I apologize if you, if you have like better pronunciation than me. But this is another word found in scripture. And its definition is described as a confident confidently anticipated expectation it is confident and it is anticipated and it is expected isaiah uses this word when he speaks about a farmer who goes out and prepares a field and plants seeds and cares for and nurtures and waters the little saplings as they grow he has hope in the fruit it will produce he has this this type of hope that is confident and anticipated and expected. If he planted apple trees or apple seeds, he is confident, he is hopeful that it will produce apples. Pretty cool, eh? It's like this neat little principle that God made where what you, you know, seed will come to harvest. So confidently seed hope. When we live with a harvest of hope within our own lives, friends, I don't know what tomorrow looks like. Do you have an idea of what tomorrow looks like? I have a hope. I have a wish. I have a wish for tomorrow. You know, I wish that the sun would come up. I'm rather confident that would happen. I wish that, you know, I'll wake up in the morning and I'll have two cups of coffee, maybe one before my kids wake up and just sit on my couch, relax a little bit. But I know I have hope. I have confident assurance that what the Lord has planted is coming to harvest in my life, in my kids' life, in the lives of those around me. And I, am, and I desire to be diligent in pursuing God, tethered to him. So when he says, it's, go, it's time to go water, all right, let's go water then. I'll follow you. If he says, it's time to go plant, be like, oh, it's planting season. Let's go, Jesus. Like, I'm following where you're going in this. See, we have hope. We have these two types of hope, ones that follows and one that is confident because we know who we follow. And friends, we get to share this. You, are the, you possess in you the good news of Jesus. I mean, do you know what's so good about this news? It's for everyone. It's for everyone. It's not for one people group. It's not for one region, not for one nation. It is for everyone for the saving of their souls the way of eternal life the way of life and life to the full as jesus would describe it in the book of john you possess the authentic hope within you and in a world that is so searching for the authentic hope man in matthew chapter 5 what are we doing for time man i'm i'm going on jeff that thing's not till 3 p.m today Oh, we're good. Um, in Matthew, I don't have that much water, Nelly. In Matthew chapter 5, we read this really cool thing. I wrote the words time dependent beside this point, and I'm just going gonna, gonna to ignore the time dependent thing. We read in Matthew chapter 5 that Jesus says to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. He says, you don't take your light and hide it under a bushel or a barrel or a jar or some, some covering. He says, you allow that light to shine bright. Friends, allow the hope you have in Jesus to shine bright. We don't know what tomorrow looks like, but we can be hopeful that our God is going to be there. And I don't mean that in a wishful hopingness. I mean that in confident, assured expectation that tomorrow... Jesus is still king. So 
Psalm 31, verse 24, I think is a really great place to end this. And it's a challenge, it's a reminder, and it's an encouragement, all wrapped into one simple sentence. Be strong and take heart. All you who hope, and this is that word uh, that's tethered with confidence and anticipation in the Lord. Be strong and take heart, all of you who are tethered in confidence in the Lord. What a challenge, what an encouragement, what a reminder. Church, we're going to do one more thing together here. And this is, uh, this was something that I just, last night I was like, man, I really think that this could be a, a cool little exercise. And so I'll preface it with this. Um, I believe that the Lord's Prayer that we find in the book of Matthew is a fantastic prayer to pray, but I also believe it's a template for prayer in, in how we approach God. And so um, over the next number of weeks, as we go through the characteristics of God, um, we're going to be inserting the characteristic that we talk about in the Lord's Prayer. Um, and so I've written a note here uh, on the screen. Um, and, uh, and if you would speak this with me, you can have a quick read through it. Make sure you want to agree with the words of it. Um, but I really feel like when, when Jesus taught us to pray, Our Father who, who lives in heaven, he wanted us to be declaring that in which we were in awe of our God for. And so I wanted to present um, this as an opportunity to be in awe of the Lord our God, El Tivka, the God of hope. And so, uh, yeah, if you feel in agreement, you can read this with me. If not, you can just stare at me blankly. It says... You can read this with me. Our Father, El Tivka, the God of hope, who lives in heaven, your hope-filled kingdom come, your hope-spreading will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us where we have chased after false hopes. Teach us to forgive and flee evil and deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and glory forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, church. We're going we're gonna to leave it there. And may the God of hope anoint you and bless you this week as you store up and hold on to that confidence, assurance in Christ. Let us uh, close today in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for today. Lord, we thank you for your word, Lord God. We thank you that we can come before you and worship you, that, Lord, your ears are attentive to the cries of our heart, and that, Father, your heart is for your children and for your people, oh God. God, your heart is for everyone. That, God, you are the God of justice and of mercy. You are the God of hope and of salvation. Father, as we go from this place, would you just build in us, would you instill in us, would we be tethered to you to pursue you as you call us on to these things? We thank you for that, Father. And Father, we also lift up this morning's tithe and offering to you, Lord Jesus, that you are the God of provision, Lord God, and you provide for us in so many ways, Lord Jesus. So Father, as we return a, 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 a portion of our financial provision back to you, to the work of your kingdom, Lord, we ask for it to be multiplied for, for the furtherance of your kingdom, Lord Jesus, and that it would be a blessing to both the gift and the giver in this act of warfare with you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for these things, Lord, and I just pray over those that as we leave this place, Lord, that we would uh, experience your presence and your peace and your hope in this week. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen.